All right, so we have been talking about contracts and we have been talking about civil court and criminal court that can be elicited between buyers and sellers. Do not forget or underestimate the fact that you yourself can be brought up on charges by other agents and by the public in two different situations. You can be brought up on a license law violation. The license law violation would be the real estate commission and they have definitions of what they would consider incompetent practice. And if you are found guilty of incompetent practice, you can be fined or sentenced with them as well. Now understand, once again, this works under the civil law kind of concept that you can be fined monetarily, but at no time can you be sentenced by the Real Estate Commission to serve time. That is a criminal court and administrative law works in the civil court area. Now what I want to do is cover some of the problems or the areas that you as a practitioner can get in trouble. And as you can see here on the screen, there is a whole long list of them that are often used to go after a practitioner or a licensee that is violating one of the administrative rules. You have to have a hearing to actually be found guilty in this particular case. So let's t talk about them. If you've engaged in fraud to gain your license, if you've cheated on a test, if you lied about your background in criminal history, anything like that, that you committed fraud or a material deception to gain your license actually is a violation. If you've engaged in fraud during your professional services or any activities that require a license, so if you've lied to a client to get them to buy the property, that would fall in this category. If you've advertised any of your goods or services in a misleading manner, suppose you hold yourself out as an expert in million dollar commercial properties and you've never done one, you could potentially be charged with advertising goods or services in a misleading manner. You could say you're a short sales specialist and you've never done one. I repair credit and you don't do that or you've never done one. If you've ever been convicted of a crime where the civil penalty include fraudulent billing practices. Now, for the life of me, I'm not sure why this one is in here. All right. So I guess it's saying if you're trying to uh, <clears throat> charge a commission on a deal you didn't do, that could be construed as fraudulent billing. Okay. If you have been convicted of a crime that has a direct bearing on your ability to practice competently or is harmful to the public. You guys know what that means? Literally, I don't either. Okay. What that virtually means is that they pretty much can look at a case by case basis and determine if this crime has the ability to practice competently or if you're harmful to the public. I do know a guy that did five years in prison, not jail, prison, for the possession of cocaine. He fessed up to it when he went to get his license. They heard his story. He pled his case in front of the commission and the commission ended up giving him a license because they determined that A, he was no longer harmful to the public or himself. So it virtually means they can look at anything they want to look at and decide independently of each case. I also know a young lady who was uh, convicted of breaking and entering and they decided to not give her a license because they felt breaking and entering was something that she shouldn't practice. Hey, don't break and enter. Here's a key. Unlock the door. <laughs> okay. If you violate any other state statute, rule, federal statute, 
that involves the practice of real estate, like fair housing, uh, RESPA violations, uh, loan, uh, fraudulent loan activities, which we are going to discuss, those could also involve your uh, bring of charges. If you continue to practice when you're unfit due to professional incompetence, i.e., hey, I thought I could do that deal. I ended up forgetting to tell him to check for an environmental report. I forget to talk about a 1031 exchange, and now my client has suffered for that. That was incompetent on my part. They could potentially bring you up on charges. Failure to keep abreast of the current professional theory. This is your continuing ed. This is this course you're doing now. If you fail to take this course and continue to practice beyond the two years, you in fact would be failing and practicing incompetently and in violation of a class A infraction that you did not keep up on your current professional practice. All right? If you become physically or mentally uh, disabled, I'm not really sure what they're going to do or how they can determine that. Um, these are right out of the 876 IAC code. So unfortunately, there is no interpretation. That is what the rule says. I am not sure how you can become mentally disabled and then charge a crime for you on that, okay? Uh, I know that there is one for the addiction to or the abuse of an illegal substance. Sometimes it's a legal substance. For instance, alcohol, that's a legal substance, but you can become dependent on it, i.e. an alcoholic, all right, or a Cleveland Browns fan. That could drive you to being an alcoholic. I could get that. Um, so I do know a, a case where a lady had several DUIs in a short-term period, and they actually required her to go to Alcoholics Anonymous and suspended her license until she returned with a uh, certificate saying she went through the class. If you're engaged in the course of lewd or immoral conduct. Now, here's the funny thing. I used to have a really cool and funny joke for this until I saw it happen. My funny joke that I used to say was, okay, so no more naked open houses, all right? <laughs> However, have you guys seen on TBS? They actually had an episode called Naked Real Estate. Uh, they have those naked and afraid. They have those naked dating. Um, so they've done this. They did one about a couple that actually were realtors in a nudist colony in Florida, and they were actually holding naked open houses. So I guess lewd and immorals in the eye of the beholder. So I don't know what that would really mean how you could be lewd or immoral. I would imagine if there was a criminal charge of, you know, harassment while you were at an open house, they could use this as a supporting documentation for uh, any charges, all right? You cannot allow your name to be used by another individual, i.e. someone that's unlicensed can't say, I work for the Modulin Group as an agent. That's a violation because they don't and they don't even have a license. If you had disciplinary action taken against you in another state, the assumption here is that you are licensed in that state, then, and those laws were similar to our laws, they can actually bring you up on charges here. So if you are caught with an illud or immoral conduct while practicing in Florida with your Florida license, they would also probably do it to you here in Indiana. That way you can't just come back to Indiana and go, well, I won't go back to Florida for a while. All right. If you've assisted someone else in doing any of these, they're going to get you for aiding and abetting and also charge you with a class A infraction. Okay. If you've allowed your license to be used by another person, if someone tries to show a house and say, well, I'm a member of the Modulin group, showing a house is a violation. That's a required activity. And they would be in violation of the one we just mentioned ago, number six, where they are actually using our name as well. If you had someone sit in for you 
to do continuing ed. Hey, sit here, take the test for me. I got to go work and someone else is doing it. In essence, you, that person's claiming to be you in that uh, course. If someone right now is doing that while you're listening to my voice, stop doing that. That's a violation to whoever you're doing it for, plus you, all right? If you've displayed your license or continue to display your license or holding yourself out as an agent after your license has become expired or inactive, revoked, suspended. So if you continue to practice like an agent, even though you've been suspended, that's also too a violation in and of itself, all right? Um, now, the one thing I will want you to remember is the Real Estate Commission is not the governing body if you have money disputes. So the funny thing is to me that the Real Estate Commission is not involved in commission disputes. You guys get that? Two different, same word used two different ways. So if there's a money issue and you think some other agent has cheated you on the money, that is not a real estate. That's not license law. That's a board of realtor law. That's who you would go and seek. And if you want to seek a violation or charge another agent with an ethics issue or a money issue, you actually then would go to the grievance committee at your board of realtors. All right. So let's go back over here for a second and see if I can do this. If you want to file an ethics complaint, there are some requirements in a timely manner that you have to do that. You must be within that 180 days. That is very key. If you file an ethics complaint on day 181, it automatically gets kicked out. All right, because it's not filed in a timely manner. I don't care if, it, if you've got video of him doing the act in action, if you don't file it in this timely manner, then you have to, it will be kicked out. So it's 180 days from the day you knew of the complaint or reasonably should have known. Or if it's a violation in the closing, it could be 180 days after the closing of the transaction. But don't get me wrong, I sit on the grievance committee for my board, which is the Indianapolis board. We have thrown out several that missed that 180 days. So you have to do that. Now, when you file a complaint against another agent, typically it's an ethics issue. There are 17 articles in the uh, NAR's Code of Ethics. We are not going to go through each one of these Code of Ethics, but I would ask you or put it inside of your skills for this chapter to actually seek out the Board of Realtors, um, the NAR's Board of Realtors Code of Ethics. And if you've never read them, Please read them so that you understand what's going on. Because if you ever need to file a complaint, you will have to list which code that person violated. Did they violate Article 11? Was it Article 1? Was it Article 17? And you need to delineate. If you put the wrong article down, when we look at it in the grievance committee, we're going to say, nope. This, based on what she claimed, uh, Article 17, that's not where this violation lies. We will dismiss it and say, sorry, you gave us the wrong article. Now, the one thing that you do need to understand is that the articles have this thing called the standards of practice. Think of the standards of practice as case interpretation or examples, and I'm using finger quotes here. These are examples of how that article could be violated. You would not cite a standard of practice if an agent is in violation and you're filling out a form. You want to cite the article, not the standard of practice. All right. So th you need to cite the actual violation itself. And now if you have questions, your local board's grievance committee ought to be able to help you with this and guide you in the direction of where they think, hey, which article do you think it is? And they will kind of say, oh, well, you need to look at maybe Article 11 and see if there's a violation in there, all right? So 
think about that, that the board of uh, your local board is what's going to take those ethics violations. Now, there's also this new thing that started in 2014, I guess it's not new anymore, is this thing called a citation that can automatically be issued if there is a clear, strong, and convincing evidence against the complainant that is so blatantly obvious, we can just issue them a citation. The citations are uh, fines, and they rank in three levels. So like your first one's 150 bucks, and then it goes like to 250, and then three, and then 500, and if you get more than three in a two-year time frame, uh, there's going to be other issues. So understand that if someone is doing something that is a has clear, strong evidence, then in essence we could issue straight, go straight to the violation and get them. What I really want to tell you is most of the complaints that we deal with are a misunderstanding or a failure to communicate. What we have here is a failure to communicate. All right? So I would encourage you, before you want to go down this path of the ethics complaint, try and work something out with the other broker. Make a reasonable effort to communicate with your managing broker and have them communicate with the other managing broker so that we both can get this straightened out without having to go for um, an ethics violation. Because once you start down this path, it is entirely possible that the grievance committee could read your narrative and actually add stuff to this. There have been cases when the grievance committee, where that a complaint has come in, they have found that that person was not in violation of that complaint, but yet found something else that they moved forward with. So you do not want to, and I don't say you don't want to be that guy that reports everybody. You certainly want our profession to practice competently, and you want to gain a good respect of the public by making sure that people that are doing bad things either aren't doing bad things or not involved in our business anymore. But with that, you've got to temper that mindset with the fact that you also probably should try and work this out before you go straight to this problem because once this problem starts and things start happening, there's going to be hard feelings and hostilities towards each other. And who knows, you're going to probably end up seeing that other agent again, hopefully in the future, because you're both going to be in the business a while. And now you've got to do another deal a year down the road with somebody that you actually filed a complaint against. Not that it was right or wrong, but it could cause, you know, issues on other deals. So just try and work it out. That's what I'm going to tell you. All right. Any questions, email me, Raymond at realuniversity.com. We are going to continue talking more about contracts and how they play out. If you haven't noticed, there has been a lot of information here. I hope you are taking some notes to help you become a better successful realtor, but you'll notice that there's a lot of information because contracts are actually a very huge part of your career. All right, hold on, we'll come back.